Well, my friends, it's done. After performing some questionable acts, I have finally obtained Fontaine's Wind Glider, and keep in mind, my friends, this week's reset was the earliest you could possibly attain it, so I think I did alright for myself. All things considered, you know, it's just, it's one of those experiences in life where it, at first it'll seem scary, but, you know, then you try it out, and you're like, this isn't so bad, and you might end up even liking it. You never know. You know, I just... I took one for the team with this one, and that's alright man, we all get to eat because of the sacrifices that I made. <laughs> anyway, Fontaine's glider has a significant amount of lore that explains a lot. A lot. I mean, for example, it gives us info on the identity of another shade. We haven't heard about another shade since Onkonomiya. It, 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 it tells us the origins of the previous Hydro Archon Egeria, explains in part how one can become an Archon, and tells us where the Primordial Sea came from. And most importantly, it tells us who Nervalette was apologizing to in this cutscene right here. A day may come when the prophecy is fulfilled and the waters burst forth, but it is not this day. This ancient power could easily obliterate an entire race. A tsunami of fury would unleash endless catastrophe. Forgive me for overruling it. Spicy stuff, huh? So without further ado, let's answer the last question. First, who was Nervalette apologizing to? The answer? The Hydro Sovereign. No. Now I know you might be going, well, <laughs> Nervalette is the Hydro Sovereign. Yeah, okay, yeah, you're, you're right, you are correct. But allow me to read you a passage from the glider description. Oh my god, I'm making it sound like I'm reading a passage from the Bible. <laughs> Legend has it that the first of oceans had a composition similar to that of blood and the life within was not individual. To set foot upon land or to take to the skies, life evolved blood vessels to keep that primordial ocean flowing within itself. The beating heart that commanded this primordial sea of blood was the first hydro dragon. Each time that heart pulsed, all life would arise and give it praise. Of course, these are simply tales that the hydro bishops tell each other and are not to be trusted. Perhaps this tale is told differently amongst other bishops, and the stories passed down between Oshi and speak of what came after. This is truly groundbreaking stuff right here, folks. Astonishing! I would even classify this as- <laughs> The Primordial Sea is the blood of the first Hydro Sovereign, and its heart kept it functioning. This explains why Nervalet is seemingly impervious to the Primordial Water, because he's another version of the Hydro Sovereign. But I'm not gonna lie, this also raises some questions in regards to how he phrased his apology. The way I'm reading this text, it makes it seem as if the Primordial Sea is a natural byproduct of the original Hydro Sovereign's existence. So why is Nervalette describing the sea as a tsunami of fury and saying the sentence is too severe if this all seems, I don't know, natural? However, the next passage may answer this and is the Michael Jordan of this whole description. Are you ready? Here we go. When that first heart was removed, the envoy of Celestia, the leader upon whose shoulders lay the duty to create life, came to the great primeval sea, and there she created another heart. That heart had like nobility unto a dragon, but lacked its outer form, and had the majesty of a god, yet was bereft of any divine duty. And though it was created by a ruler of humans, its substance and essence were all original matter from this world entirely without outside elements. She was the tears that flowed into the primordial sea seeking communication and understanding, a pursuit which caused her to weep. And it was due to this compassion that she committed all the sins that all beings of pure water must beware. So before we got into the fun stuff, it would seem at one point the Hydro Sovereign's heart was removed. Who removed it and why it was removed is left unanswered, but really quickly this could explain why Nervalette pondered earlier regarding the nature of the Primordial Sea. It could be the removal of the original heart caused the Primordial Sea to reverse its course and start consuming life. This could be the fury he was talking about earlier, as when the Hydro Sovereign's heart was removed he became enraged. Moving swiftly along, the paragraph further states that the solution of this missing heart problem was for the shade of life to put into place a new heart. The new heart was Egeria, the first Hydro Archon. G okay, a couple of things here. This is the second shade who is a female behind Istaroth. 
Uh, probably the third if the sustainer is also a shade. The primordial one made these shades from itself, mind you, and at this point it's made three women. I mean, dude, I'm not gay, but like, I, I mean, dude, look, I'm, I'm the straightest person on the on the history of the planet of the Earth. I'm, I, I, I love women. <laughs> I mean, some even say, I mean, not me, but some say that if you squint hard enough at the old women's suffrage movement pictures, I'm right there side by side with Susan B. Anthony fighting for the right to vote. But like, even at the end of the day, it's like, holy fuck, you couldn't make one dude. Were you incapable of making something like Ma'ayo from the Seven Deadly Sins? I mean, I don't know. Maybe the primary one's a Muslim and it, it's just haram to make a dude. I, 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 I don't know. I, I really don't. <laughs> please, man, please, please. Anyway. The Shade of Life created Egeria to act as a beating heart to the Primordial Sea. Interestingly, when Egeria was first born, she had no divinity despite looking the part. Now obviously we know this is short-lived because Egeria eventually becomes not only a god, but an archon. But how does this happen? This is explained a little later, but circling back to the passage we just read, she often wept into the sea to seek understanding with the world around her, and it was quote, due to this compassion that she committed all the sins that all beings pure of water must beware. Deep shit, huh? I mean, so it sounds like Egeria was a pure-spirited creation of the heavens made for the purposes of acting as a heart to the primordial sea. She wanted to have a connection with Tidvat, and due to this did something irredeemable in the eyes of the heavens. What she did is never stated. <laughs> but I think it's a safe bet that the current prophecy is the punishment given. The same thing happened to Rumeria and the nation before it, so it stands to reason that committing some sort of sin results in a way too deep pool party being thrown in Fontaine. The next passage doesn't really say anything new about Rumeria, but these last two passages... <laughs> this is where the good shit is. Humans desire judgment because they feel guilty. Humans want and so they want to give things up. Humans always desire a god. That is why the primordial sea's heart, gentle Egeria, was awarded a shard of that one who was first and gained both an Archon's rights and the divine duty come lately. Was this the desire of humanity's having reached the heavens, or was it merely the opening act of a string of dark plots? This is a tale no one can know but you. When you awake, these wings and the aforementioned tale will appear at your bedside. You can ask all the species in this world to prove if their tales are true or not, and not one of them shall believe you. For how could this wind glider and this tale materialize before you out of thin air? The penultimate passage tells us how Egeria became not just a god, but an archon, and it may have been due to two things, either people's desires reaching the heavens, or just some silly nefarious shit. I'm not really sure which it could be, but the phrase humans desire a god is noteworthy because we know of a civilization in which humans didn't desire a god and got diddled for it. Furthermore, humans desire judgment because they feel guilty is honestly some sinners in the hands of an angry god type B, because ain't no way in hell. Anyone who feels guilty wants validation of their guilt through the judgment of the gods, unless they're like some sort of 17th century pilgrim. In this case, I mean, them motherfuckers just willingly jump into the fires of hell. I deserve it! Yeah, okay, buddy. The ending passage goes on to state that everything written beforehand may be capped, so have fun figuring it all out. I mean, <laughs> sick. <laughs> Uh, one thing I wanted to point out regarding the shades now is it feels like a certainty at this point that they are following the artifact domains. We now have the Shade of Time who's Istaroth, and the Shade of Life who's unnamed but is a she. That leaves void, logic, and death all a mystery. I personally still subscribe to the idea that the sustainer is logic, but I've seen other people say void. Regardless of which it is, this still leaves one artifact domain left over even if we account for the missing shade. Which begs the question, whose domain is the final one?